Hey, how's it going everyone? I'm happy to say that today's video should be a bit of a gift for you, and although this can still be seen technically as a continuation from the last video, I ended up changing my original plan, sort of, and instead of giving you what would likely turn out to be another 20 plus minutes of me rambling, even if it might be helpful, You think I'm not quick enough? Guy thinks I'm not quick enough. Well, I got news for you. I am quick enough. I decided to jump right into a cool example that could hopefully do a lot of the talking for me and spark some further curiosity for you to want to hear more. And then I could ramble to you and elaborate further in the next video if I want to. So we're going to get right into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, my name is Derek Plavin. Welcome. If you like the stuff that you're hearing, please check out my other videos and like and subscribe as well. And also I'm available for private lessons and have a lot of available accompanying PDFs that go along with a lot of the videos on this channel, like this one today. And information for all that stuff could be found on my website as well as Patreon. Now, I don't want this video to get too conceptual like they often do, but I do want you to understand that what we're ultimately talking about here and what this example in this video begins to demonstrate is how we may go about working individual bits of material into the body or the hands for guitar. In the last video, I explained how all the different fundamental shapes for chords, scales, arpeggios, triads are all interconnected on the guitar through the cage system and how we primarily get five main ways of looking at the fretboard. So here's the thing. Sometimes to me, it seems like there's this small sort of trend that has emerged in the world of jazz education where you may sometimes hear people saying things that are akin to stuff like scales are bad. Now, while I can usually understand where these sorts of points are coming from and can actually agree with what their intentions really are sometimes, I think this can potentially cause more confusion for some people. And when it comes to guitar players specifically, which is whom this video really matters for, I think there can ultimately be a semantical confusion oftentimes when it comes to really understanding what we're learning when we're learning the caged fingerings or positions of the major scale. I want to remind you of something that I've said before, which is that when it comes to learning how to become a great jazz guitarist, I think that there's two different skill sets that we're really simultaneously developing. We want to be developing the guitar player side of things, and we also want to be developing the jazz musician or whatever other music you may like side of things as well, and they're different. The thing that determines what area you may be specifically working on is if the subject can apply universally to all musicians or instruments, or if it really only applies to stuff that is uniquely related to the guitar. So for example, stuff like transcribing, composing, chord tones and half notes exercises, working on something related to rhythm or time, etc we could say develops us more as a jazz musician. But when we're talking about anything related to the cage system, it's important to realize that we're primarily dealing with the guitar player side of things. I speculate that the reason why we so strongly associate these cage fingerings with major scales is obviously because that's what we basically get when we play all of the notes in a row in a particular fingering. But what we're really learning, when you think about it, is simply just positions for how notes can lay on the guitar and how they connect. We just attach the concept of the major scale to these fingerings when we learn them because that's what the notes inevitably spell out. But the concept of the major scale itself is separate from the guitar. And the truth is, you can find all the different shapes for all the fundamental things, whether they're triads, arpeggios, chord scales, whatever. All that stuff can be found within this position overlapping and it all diatonically relates. Just because we may learn these shapes as being fingerings of the major scale, that doesn't mean that if we were to play some sort of musical phrase in the moment that happen to fit perfectly within one of these scale positions that we were thinking about scales when we ended up playing that line. 
it's just one possible way that we could play that idea on the guitar. And the fingering or position itself usually shouldn't really have much to do with how the actual musical idea was generated and what constitutes it, unless you choose to do it like that. The truth is that having fluency and familiarity with these shapes is generally essential for being a good guitarist. And no one ever said that you had to practice these things as scales just up and down within the position forever, although that still may be helpful for more of the beginners. What really matters is that you just know the shapes, and as you work more and more material through these positions, you develop more fluency in your ability to phrase within them. Alright, so check this out. The example that we're going to get into now was actually also just part of the same stupid little clip that I had with the Legos in the last episode when I was trying to be funny. And I'm sure some of you guys already know that this of course is coming out of the beginning of the melody for the great tune by Miles Davis, Agitation. And of course, the classic recording of this tune also features the late, great Wayne Shorter. Rest in peace to him. We all just received the very sad news with that. Now, you can sort of find some real book style charts for this tune out there, but to my ears, they're not really very accurate. But even if they were, it's good to realize that we're not really looking at the opening phrase of this melody today as if it was written generically on a lead sheet but rather what Miles is literally playing on the recording note for note. Keep in mind that oftentimes it's really all the subtle little nuances and details of a phrase that can really define a lot of what actually makes it stand out or be unique. So this is what Miles plays on the recording. All right, basically this, I'll try to get it accurate. All right, and he continues. We're not looking at that second phrase, just the first phrase today, all right? Now, in this video, we're not really going to be focusing too much on anything that would be related to stuff like the harmonic analysis or possible application of this phrase, but I am probably going to mention some things. But what we're really mainly concerned with is just trying to find different possible ways that we might be able to play this musical idea on the guitar and try to find the things that really work and feel good. However, just to give you some sort of harmonic context or foundation so that it will be easier to understand how I'm going to be working through this example on the guitar, let's just start with saying for now that we could see this phrase as relating to F7. And this is irregardless of whatever the actual harmonic context may have been of the original idea. And on the recording, Technically, Ron Carter plays a G in the bass, and if we try to relate an F7 tonality to sort of like a G tonic, one thing that works is we can sort of see the F7 is coming out of a F Lydian dominant scale, which is also related to a G Mixolydian flat 6, and this is all diatonic to C melodic minor. But like I said, none of that matters at all for what we're really trying to do here. You just want to trust me and start with seeing this as relating to F7, all right? So kind of like what I was saying before, where it's all about the specifics of the phrase, you know, if I looked at these notes in relationship to a F root note, you know, we got the major third, that's like the octave lower of the second, the tonic, the flat seven, and the 13 or the six. Those are the notes that are used right and if you think about it it's subjective with the harmonic analysis like is this seen as a triad with extra notes is it an f7 arpeggio with the 13 or in the 9 is it you know just a f dominant scale and you realize like it doesn't matter and to me you know i chose this phrase because it stands out to me but the stuff that really kind of makes it stand out would be stuff like these wide interval jumps and if you saw this melody on a chart that's kind of like an accentuated, almost like a grace note. You may not even see that written in the melody. You may see something like that. I don't know. But the point is, that's why you really want to get into the specifics, because that's the stuff that is really going to teach you about the phrasing and the idea. I also think the rhythm plays a large role in this phrase. So basically, all we're trying to do today is 
work this idea into the hands or the body. And obviously, a good way to do that once you have the starting idea would be to try to find different possible fingerings for how you could play it and see what's available. And instead of just doing this by wandering around the dark, it's a lot easier to just use the cage system as a basic blueprint, all right? Now, even if the original idea doesn't quite fit into the cage fingerings of the major scale or whatever, that's okay. It, like I said, it's really just a blueprint. This idea pretty much fits perfectly within these fingerings, but that won't always be the case. So whenever we decide that we want to dive into a phrase and start to really try and work it out on the guitar individually and into the hands so that we can attempt to try to maximize what we could potentially get out of it, Regardless of how we may have originally picked out the idea on the guitar, we want to make sure that we could play the idea at least one way that would clearly lay within one of the positions of the cage system if it isn't already. Even though we're still going to be coming back to the original fingering that I just showed you, and that was how I originally learned the phrase, I actually want to start by looking at this idea in a different position, alright? So, we're going to start by looking at a fingering that would still start at the same, you know, fret and the same string, but it's a different fingering in a different position, so it would be over here. Right? Now, I'll remind you again, if we see this basically as F7, let's just think very simply and diatonically. We can think F mixolydian. F mixolydian is the same thing as B flat major, so we can see what we're doing as working through the cage fingerings or positions of the key of B flat major. All right, so this shape over here, you know, you may see that as a A, Locrian, B flat major, any of the modes. That's not what really matters, but from a visualization point of view on the guitar, you know, you may see it like that. And even though this isn't the only option, you know, if you have an A half diminished chord, and you're thinking of an idea to play over, you may play something where you can visually see it relating to that chord. And that works there, you know? And once you see that uh, shape, you know, you could practice it, moving it up and down. But that's a discussion for a whole other video, all right? So that's the only place where you could sort of pick out uh, this line within that position, meaning like octave or range. And, Everything depends on context with every individual phrase, all right? So basically, we're just going to go back through the positions of B flat major. So that one was technically the E position of B flat major. So now we would go to the G position, and that would be played over here, also starting with the same uh, note. Right? And just so you know, you know, I gave you the first two fingerings just so you had something to start with. If you want to check out the rest of these fingerings, I have the PDF available, so I would definitely recommend checking that out as well. All right? So this, you know, this position of B flat major, you can see that is G Aeolian. You can sort of see the C minor chord within it there, you know, works over C minor. Now, this particular phrase happens to work in two octaves within this position, and it's a small phrase with a short range. So when you have situations like that, you'll often get more options, all right? So I could also play this over here, uh, right? Now we're going to move to the next position, which would be the uh, A position, and this would be basically the position that we were in before, all right? Think of it like F mixolydian. Now, the way I originally played it, coming back to it, um, that note over there, you might technically see, is like kind of coming out of the actual fingering or range of the position, but it doesn't matter, and economically speaking, it's still relatively, you know, comfortable to play, and it might be a viable option for how you may play that inevitably in the moment, possibly. So, you know, you still may want to go through that fingering. Sloppy there. But, obviously, we want to see this now in the lower octave as well. Play it over, uh, you know, F7. Right? Moving along. Next, we would have uh, the C position, right? You might see that as like uh, D Phrygian. 
Now, I also kind of associate this with the fourth degree of the key, like an E flat Lydian. So playing this uh, line in this position, you know, can give you a nice sort of Lydian effect, you know. Now, that one, I believe we only have one octave. Yeah. Yeah. So moving along to the last position, that would be the D position, which in the key of B flat major, you may see is like a C Dorian. And in this position, I think we get uh, two octaves. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Right? And oftentimes, you know, if we have a minor chord, especially in a 2 5 1, we may sort of see things from that sort of Dorian uh, position in relationship to a root. So it's good to be able to work this out and find these other comfortable ways of playing the same phrase. And then if we move to the next position after that, we'd basically be back at the beginning. Right? So, you know, we're not going to really get into how exactly to practice these into detail, but this is obviously the start of it, and hopefully you can see the potential. And, you know, once you even work these out in the hands, just so you have them memorized and you're familiar with them, you know, the next thing you could obviously do with this would be application, but that would come much later. So, you know, just as an example, as an exercise, you could try to work out these phrases using different fingerings that kind of are falling within a similar position over a chord progression. So maybe I want to apply this to the A section of something like Upper Manhattan Medical Group. So I think I'm just going to leave it there for now. I don't want the video here to get too long today, but I think what I've already started to show you should hopefully spark some inspiration and, you know, hopefully start to have some light bulbs going off for you and get you excited for what's to come. All right. So if anyone has any comments or questions or anything they want to say, please put it in the comments. I'm here to help. And in the next episode, hope you're ready for the next episode. Hey. I might, you know, elaborate further on this. We're just going to kind of continue the topic sequentially anyway, but, you know, we're just going to kind of continue along with the same subject matter and get more and more into it. So, hope you're excited for that. And that's it. So, if you enjoyed this video, I would really appreciate it if you gave it a like and consider becoming a subscriber as well as a contributor to Patreon where you get all the PDFs on this channel for only $5 a month. And if you think anyone else would enjoy the content, please share it with them as well. And I will see you guys in episode 64. Swinging Every and playing time. blues. That's what we're we about. I try to help you.